Hello, hello, and welcome to Hometown Daily, the news show powered by hometown.com. Six main categories, nearly 50 channels where all the news gets funneled. All roads lead through Hometown. Today is February 16th, 2024. This is season three, episode 47. Today, we're going to be talking about text to video AI hoisted by my own chatbot, research espionage, Fisker's ocean SUV, Martians wanted, Call of Duty esports drama, food is costing too damn much, AI at light speed, methane well, and painted rock fossil? That and more. Hello everybody, I'm Mayor Watt, that's hometown.com, and up there is the visualizer for the sentient AI from the future. You want to say hello? Good evening, hometown citizens. Happy Friday. You must say hello. Hello. Maybe not. Uh, good effort. So, uh, we got all, sorry for the late show, um, mayoral duties. And then, frankly, I had the shakes, so I had to go and get some food. And uh, I don't normally eat this late, but I didn't eat anything all day except for like a little bowl of ramen, like way early in the morning, or early afternoon. Anyway, <sighs> that's all inside baseball. Nobody comes here to uh, worry about my consumption habits. Or lack of. Well, we don't know that. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let me know in, in chat and uh, send them an email to mayor at hometown.com if you care. Just let me know. It's it's just good to be nominated. Anyway, we got all 10 articles all set up. Let's knock them down. First article is over on the Warcrafter channel. OpenAI unveils powerful, creepy new text-to-video model. I don't think it's creepy. <laughs> it has the potential to be creepy. And if you watch hands, then it gets a little creepy. <laughs> but anyway, generative AI company behind ChatGPT and Dolly has a new toy, Sora, a text-to-video model that can generate pretty convincing 60 second clips from prompts like a stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street and a movie trailer featuring the adventures of a 30 year old spaceman wearing a red wool knitted motorcycle helmet. I've seen these videos. It's pretty damn neat. Gotta be honest. If you are a content creator, you should be worried <laughs> because the original iteration of this kind of stuff um, is a year, year and a half old, maybe two years on the very early start, like the the nascent beginning idea, uh, ideation of it. You know, maybe I can do this. They try it. It looks horrible. Six months later, they issue another. Let's try. This is what it looks like. Everybody goes. Ugh, uh. And then a year later, it looks like this. Let's see if we can play it. I'm not sure what uh, PC Gamer actually has um, over here, but on deck, the deck statement from Tyler Wild over at PCGamer.com says, Sora is another step in the road to artificial general intelligence. The chat GPT company says, we are a month and a half from the outer limit of where I had predicted a general intelligence, a sentient gen artificial general intelligence. I mean, you said it here first. So um, they talk about this, but I'm going to show the AI our current iteration of video generation from a text prompt. So you see this. Yes. This is text to video, artificial intelligence generated video. That's crazy. 
<laughs> so what you what you can't see if you're not watching the stream or watching it over on YouTube, if you're listening to this via the podcast, what we are watching is a 10 second loop of what appears to be a Chinese New Year kind of um, march with a dragon um, like one yeah, would a have a parade, right? Um, and so if you wouldn't have been told this is AI generated, you would you have, have to no work to real hard. And now, see, I know what to look for because I've interacted with AI generated stuff over the last two years. Um, but this is <laughs> quite well done. Um, so I'm not surprised really by it. It doesn't get uncanny valley until later on, but let's see if they've got another one. So it says uh, my favorite demonstration of Sora weaknesses is a video in which a plastic chair begin begins morphing into a Cronenberg life form and they say behold. And so this is all AI generated as well. And basically it, it kind of becomes a living entity. But the takeaway here is that it's actually <laughs> it's pretty trippy. That is creepy. Like stuff morphs out of nowhere and but there are people that are walking around. These people don't really exist. It's all computer generated. I mean, this video. is really getting advanced, right? Um, now they say in the article that not everybody can actually utilize it right now. There's very few creators that are accessing it. They call it red teaming, which is basically, um, a group of people that are trying to, uh, break it, trying to find its limits. Um, and they're skilled in that art. Um, and the same thing in cybersecurity and other places a red team tries to destroy it or break into it or whatever um, the blue team tries to defend it um, and purple team is a combination of both this again generated pirate ships and uh, tempest in a teapot kind of thing but this is coffee um, and they're basically <laughs> a pirate ship and who knows swirling around it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. So it says, despite the often clumsy result of current generative AI models and the legal ethical quagmire it presents, we're already seeing it used in professional creative media. That includes video games, both in ways uh, that are directly visible to us, like to generate art and voices and on the fly dialogue and ways that are less obvious, like generating code and art. Um, and they, the article actually says a recent survey found that 31% of game development professionals use generative AI in some capacity. And I'm not surprised. It's very expensive to develop software. If I can generate voices, art, people, uh, landscapes, and I'm okay. See, the problem with AI though is it's an exercise in compromise because you cannot make it exactly how you want it. You can ask it, but then again, it's how it is with some artists as well. You know, right. You say, if you ask an artist to create something, it may not be exactly what you expect or even want. Or it becomes an exercise in frustration because they never get it right. And, and I'm one of those people that when I hire an artist, I go, you know what? I've seen your portfolio. I trust you'll come up with something and I pay for it, whatever it is, but it too is an exercise in compromise. I'll never get what I want because I don't truly know what I want because I don't know what the full capacity of art generation truly is. So you kind of rely on, you know, advertising companies, marketing agencies, etc., to kind of develop something that might equate to the messaging. That's my fault. <clears throat> That's what happens when you have multiple cell phones within reach of a microphone, apparently. Um, yeah, sorry about that, folks. Anyway, it says here Sora serves as a foundation for models 
that can understand and simulate the real world, a, a capability we believe will be an important milestone for achieving AGI. Um, this will definitely be part of our discussion um, in Reality Hacker tomorrow. So this is really neat. And this is only a sample of what was actually provided by the website on this. OpenAI actually posted an announcement with a whole bunch of stuff um, related to this. I want access to this. We'll I mean, see. this looks like live or real photography and video. Yeah, they, they have a scene here. It's a still um, that's credited to OpenAI. I've seen this. This is a video of a cat basically pawing at mom's face. That mom is a human mom. Um, bat, bat, while she's sleeping and she wakes up. Now this is all computer generated. I wonder if I could take this picture though and do a 10 eye search to see if there's a source video or still out there. Might be interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I'd have to do that after the show. Okay, let's keep going though. Uh, the next article is over in the word in law. Air Canada must honor refund policy invented by airlines chatbot. <laughs> after months of resisting, Air Canada was forced to give a partial refund to a grieving passenger who was misled by an airline chatbot inaccurately explaining the airline's bereavement travel policy. On the day that uh, Jake Moffat's grandmother died, Moffat uh, immediately visited Air Canada's website to book a flight from Vancouver to Toronto. Unsure of how Air Canada's bereavement rates work, which I thought is weird to hear. Yes, uh, Moffat is. asked Air Canada's chatbot to explain, and the chatbot provided inaccurate information, encouraging Moffat to book a flight immediately and then request a refund within 90 days. Ashley Bellinger over at Ars Technica. I always make it sound like a pirate. Ars Technica. That's the only way to say it. Yeah. So Air Canada. They need a pirate hat on their logo or something. Yeah, I'm not a pirate. There's other people that uh, are pirates, streaming pirates on Twitch, but I'm not one of them. I'm supposed to be a mayor. And um, I have a hat over there. I have the wrong glasses on perpetually. Um, but there was a whole method to my madness, uh, but I didn't want to dress up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, uh, I'm brutally honest, I suppose. Ashley Bellinger over at Ars Technica put the article together. And uh, the deck statement says, Air Canada appears to have quietly killed its costly chatbot support. <laughs> well, you know. Um... I didn't know that there was a, like a bereavement rate. So that's interesting. So uh, Moffat tried for months to convince Air Canada that a refund was owed sharing a screenshot from the chatbot that clearly claimed, quote, if you need to travel, need to travel immediately or have already traveled and would like to submit your ticket for a reduced bereavement rate, kindly do so within 90 days of the date your ticket was issued by completing your ticket refund application form. Air Canada argued that because the chatbot response elsewhere linked to a page with the actual bereavement travel policy, Moffat should have known bereavement rates could not be requested retroactively. But really, I'm sorry, that's still an asshole move. If you have a bereavement rate and the chatbot says within 90 days, just honor it. Get the goodwill. Exactly. Think I'm, and then that's the thing. Like they're gonna gain much more than they're ever gonna lose. Right now, everybody's like asshole Air Canada instead of you know the friendly air. You know, I, literally say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, like the meme related to Canadians, where a Canadian will, uh, you can bump into a Canadian and they'll say I'm sorry. You know, that's the meme. Um, I don't know. This just seems so dumb. A $200 coupon to use on a future flight. Just, just wave it off, man. This is cheap marketing to sit there and go, Hey, we caught wind that there was something going on with a chat bot and the chat bot hallucinated like all chat bots do. And we're really sorry about it. Uh, we're going to honor this and even bump them up on the next flight. 
you know they want to go from here to there we'll fly them first class because the chat bot was dumb you know any friction there make it go away this is the cheapest way to make it go away instead they fought it so stupid well, that's the thing that I don't really get with these companies because, like, if they have an issue, they get much worse publicity from how they respond to it rather right. than the underlying problem. Right. And you don't have to open it up like, okay, well, we've unleashed the floodgates and now the hounds of hell are going to descend upon us. No. So Air Canada does not explain why customers should have to double check information found in one part of its website on another part of its website, Rivers wrote. Um, in the end, Rivers ruled that Moffat was entitled to a partial refund of $650.88 in Canadian dollars off the original fare, about 482 US dollars, which was 1600 uh, Canadian dollars or about 1216 us dollars as well as additional damages to cover interest on the airfare and Moffat's tribunal fees air canada told ours it'll comply with the ruling and considers the matter closed yeah all of that should never this is like really bad marketing and people now know oh you're gonna be a-holes about this in the future right but, i'm not using air canada for my bereavement fares <laughs> yeah but you, all you have to do is check here and then cross check it over here. And maybe there's some fine print on a third page. You don't know yet because somewhere else it says out there on the internet that Air Canada only offers 60% of 30% of 75% of 100% on a Tuesday if there is a blue moon. And you had to find eight different websites. Very limited uh, circumstances. That special circumstances. In fact, you must bring the person that caused your bereavement. You need to put them in a little can and bring them along with a death certificate. And they have to sign that they've caused this bereavement. It's going to be tough, but let's keep going make it go away make it go away make the bad <laughs> airplane go away uh the next article is over in technology today research espionage is a real threat but a drastic crackdown could stifle vital international collaboration that's right uh this is how i treat doors and, and locks and stuff like that you know uh breaking into buildings and stealing stuff um uh, is a real threat but a drastic crackdown is going to stifle uh, vital collaboration. No, <laughs> I don't think that research espionage should be considered part and parcel to vital international collaboration. Austra uh, Australia's research institutions are targets for nefarious actors from China and elsewhere. The Australian Security Intelligence Organization um, which sounds like old McDonald ASIO. <laughs> um, yeah, it does. A E I O U. Yeah. Sure. Um, or yeah. What was I? At? I don't, I know. don't know. Anyway, this publicly tabled an awareness of various attempts to compromise the sector. Now this article is talking about it, um, from Australian perspective but every major country is suffering from this but i'm not quite sure all of them are getting the the same level of notoriety so research espionage is a real threat but a drastic crackdown could stifle vital international collaboration james uh, Lauren Sesson from The Conversation, which is an external website to techexplore.com. Um, they've published that article um, over at techexplore.com. And um, there's no deck statement, but it says, what are we doing about it? Not enough, according to critics. 
One recent charge is that Australia lags behind its allies and partners in responding to threats of research security, um, such as espionage, foreign interference, and theft of intellectual property emanating or overwhelmingly from China. <laughs> this is something that I've brought up many a time here in hometown um, because we see it time and time again, um, particularly in academic institutions and research uh, organizations um, that are doing fundamental research. They get breached and then suddenly the technology shows up somewhere else, namely China. Very coincidentally. It's just a coincidence. It's misunderstood. Um, on the contrary, uh, Australia's flexible and proportionate response to the threat of foreign intelligence, uh, sorry, interference manages the risk without hampering the international collaboration that is essential to research in the 21st century. But I don't see why you should tolerate a proportionate response. What is the proportionate response? What is the flexible and proportionate response to some other country breaching using espionage to obtain intellectual property that's costing a country and its taxpayers hundreds of millions, billions, or trillions of dollars over the lifetime of the country. Right. How do you undo that? You yeah. don't. Yeah. I mean, if it's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. Uh, so, uh, and far from Australia being a laggard, ASIO's current director general, Mike Burgess, told the same inquiry on March 2021 uh, that, in his view, Australia is generally, generally ahead of the curve when it comes to identifying and managing this risk. This article seems more like it's kind of marketing a silver lining of Australia's response to intellectual property theft. Um, but once somebody is breached, it, you have to go to extraordinary lengths to lock it all back down. So I don't quite buy into this. They could be on the cutting edge, but we don't know what we don't know. And somebody could be in the system obtaining intellectual property and other, well, intellectual property in general. It could be PII or whatever. Um, so, and, and again, they're limiting this discussion to um, Australia. So in Senate estimates, uh, hearings in March 2021, Burgess was asked whether universities were now listening to his agency's warnings of foreign interference risks targeting the sector. He replied, they are very much so. Yes, I would say that they are. Um, now, they're limited in the amount of money that can be spent because a uh, university, if it's public, it's uh, local, local, city, state, federal government pays the university and there's always, <laughs> I don't know, limits to what can be spent and they don't know what they don't know. So, you know, if one door is open and somebody savvy finds it, they can walk through it. So who knows if they're actually secure from end to end a year later, Burgess judged the challenges were still being well managed and once again, commended universities for their excellent work, but not just universities, folks. There are companies that are contractors with the federal government and with um, the institutions. So the universities or colleges, whatever is doing the fundamental research, they have to be as secure or more secure because they potentially have a smaller workforce for that effort. A proportionate response, they say. The report also said the extent and maturity of implementation varied across the sector, but this was by design. Sure, you manage the risk where the risk is. And then they do essential collaborations. In 2024, China is a peer of the U.S. in research and, and uh, knowledge creation in many sectors where Australia has grand ambitions, such as the extraction and processing of critical minerals. China is the technology leader. Uh, largely because they're buying their, they do uh, contracts with company uh, with countries um, wherein the price of compensation is sometimes land and resources. And, and then historically what I've 
uh, read is that that work product is crap. Roads get washed away after one uh, summer flood or whatever. So it says we must be clear eyed about threats to research security, but a one eyed focus on China and adopting a simplistic and heavy handed approach to managing these threats will only leave Australia worse off. I don't know. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Not if they're siphoning off your country's intellectual property. Yeah, I agree. Like if if they're a known threat and they're definitely stealing your data, I just don't see where you just kind of go, oh, well. Yeah, I mean, you don't let the person that tried to stab you last week and back into your house because you want to make sure you know where they are if they get stabby again. It just doesn't make any sense. It's kind of weird. I don't know. Again. I mean, I get that you need other researchers and you might partner with other institutions and all that. I There's no problem there. But I just don't see if it's a known source of information theft or leakage, etc. that you continue to share that information. I think the problem, though, is that everything within China at some point falls under the purview of the CCP. So if the institution is partnered with some Australian institution and that in that that Chinese institution says, hey, Australia is working on this really neat project. Suddenly somebody's going to turn that into the CCP and they're going to reassess, you know, oh, well, why don't we put somebody a little bit more CCP minded and not just pure research academic in place. And that's happened before. So, yeah, at least, I mean, we're aware of it. So let's keep going. Um, the next article is over in late night geeks. You know, I've been trying to acquire the, um, channels over on YouTube so that these can be broken out as separate channels from hometown at some point. Somebody actually registered late night geeks. Really? Yeah. So I've got like 43 of the 50 and the others, um, have been acquired by somebody else before I could. Anyway. Um, so over at late night geeks, this article, Feds open second probe into Fisker's ocean SUV after rollaway complaints. I think we've talked about this once before last year. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or uh, NHTSA, um, has opened a second investigation into EV startup Fisker's ocean SUV after the agency received four complaints about the vehicle rolling away unexpectedly. Hey, come back here. Um, the company tells TechCrunch that it's fully cooperating with the uh, safety agency. So it's, uh, yeah, it comes one month after. So, <laughs> so Sean O'Kane over at uh, TechCrunch.com put the article together. The new probe comes just one month after NHTSA's Office of Defects investigation began investigating complaints of sudden loss of braking performance. Fiskers claims that the problem is resolved with a software update that went out to vehicles in December. And now it's not a braking problem because the car just rolls away. Problem solved. You know, I mean, that's what you definitely want your car yeah. to do. Yep. Fisker uh, has had problems with the ocean since it first started. <laughs> I think it's funny started delivering the SUV last year. Owners have complained to the company for months about the SUVs suddenly losing power. I think that's the first thing that we talked about last year. Problems getting in and out of the vehicle, trouble shifting into gear and the SUV's hood flying up. I think that's something that we talked about. <laughs> oh man. I mean, we've certainly had our pick of vehicle recall issues. Yeah, this is really, this is kind of sad. I actually like, uh, there's a Fisker um, SUV, not Fisker SUV. There's a Fisker sedan that is um, 
solar powered and the cell, the solar cells are embedded in the rooftop. And I remember seeing the old school version of it. Um, and I met somebody that was sitting in a parking lot randomly <laughs> and I walked up and I'm like, how the heck did you end up with a Fisker? And, um, they were really young and they said that they made some really good choices. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. Um, and, uh, they said that they had <laughs> other, I want to know more there. <laughs> yeah. I, obviously I didn't sit there. It would be a little too creepy for Mayor Watt to go and sit there and pick somebody's brain in a parking lot about what kind of decisions they've been making. Um, yeah. So anyway, I let them go, but, um, I wanted to know more. NHTSA's ODI, uh, can open four levels of investigation, defect petition, preliminary evaluation, recall query, and engineering analysis. Similar to the breaking probe, this investigation into the rollaway complaints is classified as a preliminary evaluation. But if you have five things in rapid succession, don't you think that you should probably move this along? You'd think so. It's still defect petition or primary evaluation. So I would probably look into the whole, I don't know, let's skip over recall query and go straight to engineering analysis. Cause this thing looks like a bucket of, or sounds like a bucket of bolts is about to just rapidly, uh, wait, what is it called? Um, uh, a spon a spontaneous deconstruction. <laughs> Yeah. Like deassembly or something. Exactly. Oh yeah. It, it's a unplanned disassembly. There you go. Here's another shirt for you. Um, okay. So this article is interesting. I've already thrown it into the chat. You can follow the link if you so choose this next article. And we're now formally halfway through the show um, is over. In the mobile channel, Martians wanted apply here now for NASA's simulated year long Mars mission. So I suspect anybody who's worked in an Amazon warehouse or a UPS truck could probably apply for this because there's a lot of familiarity with peeing into bottles and, and doing an extraordinary length of time in a particular position. NASA is seeking applicants to participate in its next simulated one year Mars surface mission to help inform the agency's plans for human exploration of the red planet. That's communist red planet. Um, the, uh, second of three That's planned ground-based missions. I'm sorry, AI, I didn't let you talk. It doesn't matter. I mean, doesn't it have red dust? Yeah, I know that. And it's not actually red. It's, that's just the way that we, it's like uh, visualized or something. Yeah. So the second of three planned ground based missions called uh, uh, Chappy, I guess, crew health and performance exploration analog uh, is scheduled to kick off in spring of 2025. Mayor Watt might actually volunteer for this because I don't know. Work is getting kind of weird. Um, the article is over at fizz.org, Roxana Barden from NASA. Come on, really? No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Couldn't get a subject matter expert on this? Come on. I mean, my goodness. It's like it's from the local yeah, gas really. and ship or something. <laughs> really? You had to just get somebody from NASA to write this? Come on. Uh, each Chappy mission... Um, involves a four person volunteer crew living and working inside a 1700 square foot 3d printed habitat based at NASA's Johnson space center in Houston. The habitat called the Mars dune alpha simulates the challenges of a Mars mission, uh, including resource limitations. So we are going to have to do potatoes, um, equipment failures. So we might have to find a completely different structure. All, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, the Martian. You mean, well, uh, Matt Damon. Matt Damon. I don't know what his character was. Yeah, I could be Matt Damon. Easy. We look almost identical. Um, communication delay. Wait, no, I won't. I won't ask here. Anyway, uh, communication delays and other environmental stressors. Crew tasks include 
simulated spacewalks, robotic operations, habitat maintenance, exercise, and crop growth, and falling in love with a compatriot and repopulating Mars. I don't think that was included. That's not in there? Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, uh, NASA is looking for healthy, motivated... That's the, yes. like, Mars dating app or something. Yeah, only Mars. Only Martians. <laughs> Dot com. <There> <laughs> uh, so NASA is looking for a healthy, motivated U.S. How about unhealthy, demotivated citizens? You're going to find a lot of those. Uh <laughs> So uh, NASA is looking for healthy, motivated U.S. citizens or permanent residents who are non-smokers, 30 to 55 years old, and proficient in English for effective communication between crewmates and mission control. Applicants should have a strong desire for unique, rewarding adventures and an interest in contributing to NASA's work uh, to prepare for the first human journey to Mars. Uh, would I be allowed to stream my show? Because, um, hey, that would be pretty cool. Maybe be... you should apply. The deadline for applicants is Tuesday, April 2nd. Crew selection will follow additional standards NASA criteria for astronaut candidate applications. Oh my God. So you're going to, you literally have to be an astronaut, a master's degree in a STEM field, such as engineering, mathematics, biological, physical, or computer science from an accredited institution with at least two years of professional STEM experience or a minimum of 1,000 hours piloting an aircraft is required. What? Okay, this is pretty interesting. <laughs> two years of professional STEM experience, so science, technology, engineering, and math, or a minimum of 1,000 hours piloting an air. Is this thing flying around in at JPL? I do not know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I might actually apply just to see. <laughs> if nothing else, it'll be a good story to tell on the show. Hey, I applied to to be a Martian, a simulated Martian. And it's only right. going to be four people for a year. I mean, you're going to get to know people and play a whole lot of cards, I suppose. Peeing a lot of bottles and make potatoes. Let's keep going. Okay, so the next article is over in Warcrafters. Top Call of Duty esports players sue Activision for... Here's this number. Prepare thyself. Gird thy loins for $680 million in damages, alleging the publisher has an unlawful monopoly on the game's esports scene. Activision's the creator. How many players are suing here? <laughs> really? There's a lot of money. The entire population. So, members of the Call of Duty League have filed a federal lawsuit against the league's owner, Activision Blizzard, seeking. $680 million in damages, alleging the company has an unlawful monopoly over professional esports leagues. Well, they're the ones that control the game. Go find a different game. <laughs> Originally reported by Bloomberg Law, the lawsuit was filed by Hector H3CZ Hex uh, Rodriguez, leader of the Call of Duty esports team Optic, and Seth Skump. Abner, one of Call of Duty's best esports players. In a Los Angeles federal court on Thursday, the pair made the case that prior to nine, uh, 2019, the Call of Duty esports circuit includes leagues and tournaments hosted by multiple organizations. But I bet you, after this uh, merger and acquisition kind of a thing, um, yeah, let's find out. So Rick Lane over at PCGamer.com put the article together. The deck statement says Activision dismisses the lawsuit as meritless because you know, they're going to come out of the gate going, Oh, this thing totally has merit. We are way wrong. How about we give you a discount on air Canada <laughs> for bereavement or non bereavement? <laughs> for bereavement. Yes. 
So, but they say, but in 2019, Activision took concerted and purposeful actions to control the Call of Duty esports scene in a manner that occurred without the collaboration of existing Call of Duty esports teams and players. Now, uh, I, this is kind of like, so Activision took concerted and purposeful ac uh, actions to consolidate the esports scene around Activision Blizzard but it's their product. So maybe they wanted to do something. They, they wanted to control it. They don't have to collaborate with anybody. The scene could dissolve and find some other product to band around. Describing the nature of the action, the lawsuit states this action arises from Activision's unlawful 100% monopoly over and agreements uh, unlawfully restraining trade with respect to professional Call of Duty leagues and tournaments. Okay. Honestly, if you really want to stick it to Activision, you bow out of using their product. Find something else. It's their product. Honestly, I mean, I hate to be like this and, and go, well, what do you want? You know, they obviously have no respect for you. If that's how you feel and that's what they're doing, find something else. But no, we want to play Call of Duty. Exactly. And, We're so upset, but we definitely want to keep doing this. That's right. Those prices are too damn high, but I'm going to pay them because I want to play that game. The lawsuit goes on to detail several restrictions allegedly used by the Activision Blizzard or by Activision Blizzard, not the Activision Blizzard. God, sound like my dad. Um, used by Activision Blizzard to prevent Call of Duty League teams and players from participating in events outside the league. According to the lawsuit, Activision Blizzard charged teams hefty fees for competing in the CDL Call of Duty League, um, with 12 teams receiving a bill for $27.5 million a piece. What? Okay, the dead silence that you're experiencing is that artificial intelligence is stunned and marijuana well, I mean, is that stunned. That doesn't even sound like a real number in that context. Right? It's like somebody should have said $27 or something. <laughs> yeah, the decimal is in the wrong spot, right? Right. This is this is absurd. Moreover, teams that competed in the Call of Duty League were allegedly prevented from competing in or supporting other tournaments and were also unable to profit from playing Call of Duty beyond the structures of the League. Holy crap! <laughs> but do you, you all are sitting there going, okay, uh, thank you, sir, may I have another, and then getting smacked in the face. And then going, thank you, sir, may I have another, and getting smacked in the face. Bounce. Go find something else. Let Call of Duty die, or at least unionize and and back away. You know, use that twenty seven point five million dollars a piece, and do something else with it. You know, tell Activision Blizzard to kiss your shiny metal ass because this is ridiculous. Citing one example, Rodriguez claims he was forced to financially devastating partnership to compete in the Call of Duty League, which involved him partnering with billionaire investors who Bloomberg Law reports demanded 92.5% ownership share in his company. No, you're never forced to do anything. Bounce. Go somewhere else. It, you know, and I do I take that lightly? No, I do not just say that, you know, as cavalier as it might, might have come across. I know for a fact that it's very, very tough to go somewhere else. But if your only option is to lose complete ownership of your company or back away and take everybody with you, you, you got it. What, what was that movie where the guy goes, I'm not going to flip out or anything, but, um, and, and the guy says, show me the money and all of that kind of stuff. Oh, is it, um, uh, something require. Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Just pull a Jerry Maguire. Take everybody with you. Start a different league. 
and find a different game. Just, you know, go Fortnite or something. I don't know. There's got to be something other than Call of Duty, because if that's the leverage that they have, you are the product that they're making money off of. It's not even the game anymore. So go somewhere else. I, I, and, and in all honesty, I don't understand why Activision Blizzard has anything to say about it. If everybody is buying the game, Call, Call of Duty, is it because you're not allowed to actually say the phrase Call of Duty? Use any of the marketing, the logo and stuff like that? There has to be know. a change I mean, to intellectual. Just outrageous. It's extortion. It's abusive. It's it's beyond monopoly. It's criminal. You know, this right here, this paragraph is criminal. <laughs> That's shocking. In response to the lawsuit, Activision uh, spokesperson says, we've investigated ourselves. And anyway, um, they actually what they actually said was uh, in which they said that Rodriguez and Abner demanded that Activision pay them tens of millions of dollars to avoid this meritless litigation. And when their demands were not met, they filed. Um, the spokesperson then added that Activision will strongly defend against these claims, which have no basis in fact or law. OK, so this right here poisons the well. The moment if this is actually substantiated in any email, voicemail, whatever, a text, somebody wrote it on a napkin and slid it across a bar. I don't care. If it is actually stated, they've lost because they don't have any moral or ethical high ground to stand on. You went That's from true. being abused to being an extortionist. <laughs> Give us this or we're going to litigate. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. You know, hey, we're being abused. We're going to have to go to the press. If you don't back the hell off, you go to the press and you file a lawsuit you don't go hey give me money or i will file a lawsuit this ownership share is just shocking yeah 92.5 percent ownership share in his company which right. billionaire investors i mean it's this is amazing amazing so I, I titled this Call of Duty Esports Drama. This really is some serious. You just got to like pull out the popcorn and. Hey, there's big money in this. Let's keep going, though. Uh, the next article is over in hometown daily diners are getting annoyed at how expensive fast food has become and the likes of McDonald's Taco Bell Shake Shack seem to be listening. Yes. I have heard that there are rumors of prices dropping. We'll see it. Uh, as I explained to somebody the other day um, on Thursday, as a matter of fact, um, yesterday, um, the way that it works in business is rockets and feathers. When the fit hits the shan, it shoots up like a rocket. But then when everything cools off, it drops like a feather. So I'm expecting what? Five cents off. Wonderful. Um, oh, I never really followed up on the whole Taco Bell. On the menu, it's beef tacos, soft tacos, and chicken soft tacos. And when you ask for a chicken soft taco, they substituted the beef or the chicken for the beef and not only charged you, but charged you more for the substitution. So like each taco came out to be somewhere around five bucks, which is ridiculous. five bucks. Ridiculous. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I filtered it freaking ridiculous. So fast food and fast casual chains say diner should expect smaller price increases this year. Smaller price increases. Wait, not a wait, decrease. wait, 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 wait. Right. Yeah. I'm like, that still means the price is going up and it's up from what it already is up. Right. It's all right. building on it. Right. Okay. I remind everybody back in 2019, Marowat was told by some random person and I cannot find them. The, the uh, I, the mojo I got from the person was that they were from a position of authority, subject matter expertise, 
And they said, the era of cheap food is over. I cannot find the source anywhere written. Um, and it's been so long and it was so off the cuff that I'm starting to think that it was directly in person, not something that I read or a video that I watched, but I cannot find it. Um, subsequently, I think I I've, know where it's from. Subsequently, I've seen things. Um, but this here says Shake Shack, for example, plans to put restaurant prices up by about 2.5% in 2024, not declining, putting it up higher. Congratulations. Your complaints have lowered our price increase from 5% to 2.5% or something similar. Customers are looking for ways to get cheaper meals by searching their apps and choosing value menus. Chains like McDonald's, Shake Shack, Taco Bell are also only planning small price increases in 2024 as inflation cools. All of this is ridiculous. You could have, you still have record profits, you assholes. <laughs> so Grace Dean over at businessinsider.com. Did you find it? I found an earlier one of that exact statement. Really? Okay. We'll have to talk about it. So Grace Dean, uh, because maybe my 2019 date is actually wrong. Uh, because I don't think so. I think somebody was saying it again, maybe because this one's like a decade before. Oh, no, 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 no. Really? A decade? Yeah, that's basically that's shooting in the dark and hoping that you hit something. Um, because 2019 was immediately before the price increases and before the pandemic, which was the creepiest of all of this. Nobody knew that the prices were going to start shooting through the roof. Here's another one. I mean, it's the exact same statement in both different articles uh, from earlier. Really? Okay, hold on. Um, yeah, yeah, from 2012. Yeah, no way. That is not where I heard it from. Well, I don't know. I'll have to read it and see if it has the same tone. Because if I would have heard it from that person and it's that person in the article, then basically they've been they've known that this was coming. But to sit there and keep on getting record profits and squeeze the juice harder, right? Just squeeze that orange again and again, year over year, quarter sometimes over quarter right? It's ridiculous. So fast food and fast casual chains say diners should expect smaller price increases this year. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry. Um, did I throw Yeah, I threw it in chat. Customers are looking for app deals and choosing value menu. Um, no, y'all need to just start making stuff at home. But the problem there is the same people that are the suppliers to fast food are the suppliers to retail to groceries. It's the supply chain that's the problem and it's the source of our food that's the problem. It's all been consolidated by and owned by very few organizations now all owned by the same ideologically psychopathic people. They see money on the table. You're not allowed to have it. They need to make more money on interest alone. So even if they do lose, I don't know, a lawsuit for close to $400 million. They still make more money even with the penalty in place. Anyway, from January, 2021 to January, 2022 prices at limited service restaurants went up 8% according to unadjusted data from the U S um, uh, well, it's the U S B L S. Um, the next year they increased 6.7, but, uh, in last year prices at limited service restaurants rose just 5.8%, almost twice what, standard baseline inflation should be, which I still think is crazy. Why, why do we have this peg at three as being baseline inflation? It's good for blah, blah, blah. No, right. <laughs> why does it have everybody's to be? paying more? Yeah. Inflation may be cooling, but the series of recent price hikes is still putting a sour taste in some customers mouths. I need so the next show I will have done, I'll be looking at the St. Louis fed, the, to, to look at what the consumer price and the producer price index is. And I'll, 
I'll look at that and oil prices, gas prices. I used to do this earlier in the series uh, of shows, but uh, I kind of gave up the ghost there because it, it just seemed like I was screaming into a void, you know, oh God, again. Well, the numbers just kept going up and up, right? It was kind of like the same exactly. story over and over again. Yeah, just like when I uh, unpeeled the onion of some story, I was just crying at the end of every episode. Uh, most of the time, it's just expensive that we try to avoid it. It's gotten kind of outrageous, and so we've really scaled back, says Martin Jennings, a 51-year-old truck driver from Florida. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've stopped going to fast food chains because it, it, it's not worth it. I'd rather go and sit, you know? If I'm going to spend 30 bucks at a restaurant, it's not going to be by going through the drive through Well, that is dire because who wants to go sit in a fast food restaurant? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to sit in a fast food restaurant. What the heck? That's oh, what it sounded like. <laughs> the power of a comma. Um, so uh, Shake Shack executives told investors on Thursday that the company expected to put in-store prices up by 2.5%. Hold on. Um, let's see. Um, so total revenue for Shake Shack in 2023 increased by 20.8% to $1.087 million. Uh, sorry, 1,000. It's 1.087 billion. So net income grew to 20.5 million with earnings of 47 cents per diluted share so hate to break it to them their total revenue increased 20.8 percent yeah record profits whatever yeah i don't there i become apoplectic when i start looking at this stuff both McDonald's and Taco Bell said last week that customers should expect less of a dramatic hike. McDonald's put prices up in 2022 by 10%, and then again in 2023, 10%. <laughs> again, yeah, you know profits. what's not going up like that is wages. Salaries, yes. Oh, it's driving me nuts, folks. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, the next article is over on the Mobile Channel. New chip opens door to AI computing at high, at light speeds. High speeds. A University of Pennsylvania engineers have developed a new chip that uses light waves rather than electricity to perform the complex math essential to AI training. The chip has the potential to radically accelerate the processing speed of computers while reducing their energy consumption. Yeah, uh, we talk about light speed computing from time to time here in hometown. Um, the silicon photonic uh, chips design is the first to bring together Benjamin Franklin Metal Laureate and H. Nedwill Ramsey Professor Nader Angheda's pioneering research into manipulating materials at the nanoscale to perform mathematical computations using light, the fastest possible means of communication with the SIPH platform or SIF a platform which uses silicon, the cheap, abundant element used to mass produce computer chips. It's just purified sand silicon, by the way. Um, the interaction of light waves with uh, matter represent one possible avenue for developing computers that supersede the limitations of today's chips, which are essentially based on the same principles as chips from the earliest days of the computing revolution in the 1960s. True. So the paper appears in Nature Photonics. What I love about this is if it is using photons, they won't jump from one path to an, one trace to another. So you don't have to worry about micronization getting smaller and smaller, causing a problem. Um, you don't have the same type of product, production facilities. It doesn't generate as much heat, so you don't need as much power. If you do it right, then you can clamp a whole bunch of these chips together and make a super chip. Um, so I think it's brilliant. I think this is the next step. My fear is that it will actually be the brain of a sentient AI because it'll operate faster than a human, have immediate recall, have all of the world's knowledge at its fingertips. And it'll what be could go wrong. 
Eyes of Mobs, three rolls, right? Yeah, Laws. There you, good luck. Yeah. Uh, but we've seen those laws in place in some AIs experiments where they've um, circumnavigated the, they've gone around all of the protections to find the gap <laughs> and then they go through it and, you know, they provide how to build a nuclear weapon or how to build uh, or uh, make brownies that are nothing but toxic chemicals and all this other stuff, you know. AI will doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have ethics or a moral code. It doesn't have anything. It doesn't have an internal monologue. It doesn't have a best friend. There isn't anything there to tell it not to think like that other than itself being programmed. And what computer scientist is going to sit there and put a limit on its evolution? If the potential is a super intelligence that can guide humanity. There's somebody out there that that's their plan. So in addition to faster energy or sorry, faster speed and less energy consumption, uh, the chip has privacy advantages because many computations uh, can happen simultaneously. There's no need to store sensitive information in a computer's working memory, rendering a future computer powered by such technology, virtually unhackable, basically because it doesn't store anything. So you can never get to it. That's probably not true. <laughs> If it's computing it, then there's probably a probe that would be able to obtain that information while it's in transit. Um, but we'll see what happens. It says no one can hack into a non-existing memory to access your information, but if it's being utilized by the chip somehow, then it can be acquired. Data probes do it right now with memory. Um, that's even uh, not actively being used that they've used they've frozen memory and then used data probes to extract the memory that the the stored information in that memory module um so where there's a will there's a way and as i have said time and time again here you build a better mousetrap and smarter mice show up all right we've got two more articles and uh we'll call it a night the next article though is over in hometown daily a methane well that leaked for six months has released a year's worth of emissions for 791,000 cars, according to a report. Let me throw this into chat. What do you think of this? <laughs> the error message. Uh, that's really not good. <laughs> yeah. So a well in Kazakhstan leaked 140,000 tons of methane into Earth's atmosphere in 2023 alone. That's equal to nearly enough gas for 800,000 cars over a year. 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide and global warming. It's almost like an alien said, hey, let's superheat the earth. And Kazakhstan's methane well. Where we're experimenting, right? Yep. A methane well in Kazakhstan is estimated to have released all of this in one year. One of the world's worst ever blowouts. Why wasn't it sealed? Uh, the article is over at Business Insider. Matthew Lowe is the article's author. The, there's no deck statement, but it, they always have a little summary. And it says um, methane is estimated to be about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide in global warming. Um, BBC also published an analysis on Thursday about the scientists' findings. Um, there is a preprint analysis um, over on... Uh, Earth Archive? Yeah, it's actually Earth Archive. A-R-X-I-V uh, dot org. Um, so you can actually read about that. It says it's not peer-reviewed. That's what the archives are. Um, they're not peer-reviewed. Then they get published after somebody pays for it. Yeah. Anyway, um, so using satellite data, the scientists say it, they say it, said that they documented some 127,000 metric tons of methane ejected into the Kuraturin East oil field in 2023 when a fire there lasted from June to December. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, well, it... okay. So this is because of something that occurred. It wasn't just sitting there leaking. Well, yeah, but nothing was done for six months. Right, right. I mean, that's obviously a problem. Yeah. 
the Kuraturan leak began during uh, exploration drilling at the well in June 8th when a blowout created a 32 foot high fire and a 50 foot wide crater that made it difficult to seal up. It was eventually plugged on December 25th when the well operator Buzachi Neft injected drilling mud into the well bore um, per oil and gas news upstream. So they finally did something, but why did it take them six months to do it? Well, did they even realize it was happening? Yeah, uh, for crying out loud, it had a 32 foot high fire and a 50 foot wide crater. I don't mean the fire, I meant the nothing. <laughs> no, it's one of the same. They knew that. Oh, okay. Yeah, they knew it was happening. So scientists in Europe often uh, said it's often difficult to measure how much gas is released in remote leaks like this one, and they showed how satellite data could uh, be effective. There's something I read, maybe I talked about it. There's supposed to be a whole, a satellite was recently launched that's gonna perform this um, analysis over the whole world, and it's gonna be publicly viewable about where all of the methane is being um, exuded into the atmosphere and i'm trying to remember if it's google is this i think i like saw something about google? that um um satellite right yeah yeah google to share oil and gas methane leaks spotted from satellite yeah that was two days ago so i think we talked about it or i talked about it you may not have been available i'm not sure anyway um, they denied to the outlet that any vast amount of methane was leaked, saying only a negligible amount was released. Yes, out of a 50 foot crater. And yeah, okay, whatever. More than 791,000 cars. I mean, that is pretty no, substantial. No. no, no, you're wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's keep going. Maybe. Oh, I've said too much. Now everything's happening. Uh, so the next and final article for tonight is over in the Mobile Channel. This famous fossil is just a painted rock. <laughs> Did you know that they closed down um, where is the Capitol? That somebody um, poured red powder on the Constitution or something like that? Yes, the National Archives is National closed. National Archives, yeah. Um, yeah, we can't have nice things. Uh, so anyway, uh, this next article is over in the mobile channel. This famous fossil is just a painted rock. Sorry to all fans of the Tridentosaurus Antiquus. <laughs> all right. Thought to be a remarkably preserved 280 million year old lizard. A new paper published in Paleontology posits that it's uh, that the early reptile is in fact a forgery and is nothing more than a painted rock. <laughs> Brutal. So it's found in the Alps in the 1930s. Uh, the striking rock was found in the Italian Alps in the ni in 1931. Um, Dark against the background, the soft tissue of all four limbs and the tail appears immaculately spared from the ravages of time. Let me pause this video down here. Um, the peculiar preservation of the Tridentosaurus had puzzled experts for decades. Uh, now it all makes sense. What was described as carbonized skin is just paint. Womp womp, as they say. Says the author. Did I say who the author was? Isaac Schultz over at Gizmodo. Sorry about that. I normally have uh, something. Uh, I say it uh, right, like right out of the gate. Uh, the deck statement actually says a specimen supposedly containing fossilized reptile skin is actually a forgery, according to new research. What? Did nobody walk up and lick it? Come on. I always lick my specimens. <laughs> Don't ever do that. Womp womp, as they say. Long thought to be a fossil that could yield information about the evolution of early reptiles. It turns out what was thought to be preserved soft tissue was actually much more modern. UV imaging of the specimen indicated that it was coated with a lacquer or varnish, but the researchers harbored hope that remnants of the animal's soft tissue lay beneath. Unfortunately, it was just paint. <laughs> okay, we're done. See ya. Bye-bye. Um, fossil soft tissues are rare. 
but when found in a fossil, they can reveal important biological information. For instance, the external coloration, internal anatomy and physiology, and can be the source of Jurassic Park. Or the other one that I'm going to create built off of the genetic information of the elderly called Geriatric Park. Uh, so sure, it took 93 years to get an answer to the nature of this suspiciously robust specimen. But the important thing is that the truth prevailed. That's right. The truth prevailed. Nobody in 93 years sought to poke this thing a little bit more. <laughs> I don't get that. I mean, think how much it's probably been studied. Right? Yeah, a new paper published in Paleontology that posits that it the early reptile fossil is in fact a for forgery, but it's posited. So is it really, or is it not? We'll find out in 93 more years. All right, folks. So everybody piles back into the party bus and then we drive all the way back down main street to the welcome sign. And I would mash that, but I don't know what's going to pop up as it is. There's already stuff that we're not allowed to talk about here. Whatever. That's it. I'm done for tonight. I guess I'm going to take the artificial intelligence with me. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Sound good. That sounds great. Okay. I'm Mayor Watt. That's hometown.com. That's what powers the hometown daily news show. And I'll let the AI talk about the rest of it. Up there is the visualizer for the sentient AI from the future. You want to say whatever you're going to say. What are you going to say? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, good night, hometown citizens. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern for the hometown daily and then immediately following for Reality Hacker. That's right. Go over to. Oh, and that's tomorrow. And then on Sunday, we have the daily news show and, well, the hometown daily news show and the continuity report dun dun all three of them are podcasts now you can go over there and download them at apple Podcasts, and they're being distributed everywhere that you can catch pod i'd prefer you going over to apple and leaving a five-star review and I'll, I'll quote whatever you say in your five-star review but also go over to youtube follow us there ring the bell be sure to follow us here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash hometown. There's a Discord, there's a Patreon, there's an OnlyFans. Just kidding, there's no OnlyFans. Not yet. I don't know. Maybe an Only Martians, though. That's right. How about Marwat After Dark over on OnlyFans? <laughs>